Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 632, the post-election, mid-COVID edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 17, 2020. All right, I'm going to ask your forgiveness up front before we get started. You're going to hear a little humming in the background. That's the the generator to the, the RV. We're currently parked um, at our timeshare here in Florida and having worked onto the RV. And yesterday I, I had the RV tech out here. We're getting lots of the, the, the squeaks out, the little leaks out, all the stuff that annoys my wife to death are fixed. However, I left something on overnight and ran the batteries completely dead. So when I came out to tape today, uh, the, just nothing. You know, the laptop battery turned on. That was it. So uh, George and I are, are doing this with the generator. You're going to hear the humming. I'll try and talk loud so you don't hear the humming. That's just the reality. Uh, people want to know where I am. I'm right outside Orlando and Kissimmee. I got to go see the locket, the uh, SpaceX rocket launch, George. That was awesome. You must oh. love living in Florida. You know, is there so much to do here? If, come on down, folks. <laughs> yeah, come on down. <laughs> real estate prices are cheap. Well, great yeah. Episcopal churches. Uh, great Episcopal churches. So, uh, Jill and I are having a great time in this uh, COVID travel. Um, I, there's two things, George, and I want to talk about. There's not a lot of Anglican news out there. There's not a lot of there's religious angles to the news, but we're going to talk about COVID. And we're going to talk about the election. We're going to do this raw. We, we set up in our pre-show that what we wanted to talk about. But a, as things started to come out in our pre-show, I said, stop. Let's just do this raw on tape. Um, before we do that, nobody nobody asked how George is. George, how are you doing? I'm just fine. Uh, my wife, Susan, is trapped in Seattle. They've done a lockdown. And so she'll be there. Uh, they'll let people leave. Uh, but you can't go out, you can't do anything. Susan, while she was there, had bought one of these passes to see all the sights of Seattle. So the, they announced that last night at midnight, the uh, lockdown would go into effect. So in the last three days, she's gone to the art museum, to the Space Needle, using all the, uh, and she was the only person in all these places. So she's uh, now uh, locked in with our children in Seattle and Hopefully, we'll be able to get out uh, before Christmas. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, we haven't... Otherwise, who's going to do the Christmas patch? And I can't do it. In the last seven days, we've had two pharmaceutical companies announce that they have a vaccine um, for COVID. One is 90% effective, one is 94% effective. And that they're going to administer these as soon as possible. They're getting the doses together. They're going to distribute them, um, uh, hopefully, to within North America quickly, uh, to the elderly as quick as possible, uh, and, and then around the world. I don't know what the plan is. And I thought we'd talk about this because, um, thank God, there is hope in the horizon because the government is coming really hard on churches, George. This is getting worse. They're stopping baptisms. They're making weddings no fun anymore. Um, it just it, enough already. Well, in England, with its centralized authority in uh, in England and Wales, the uh, the government really has gone overboard under Boris Johnson, from my perspective. Sure. Looking at some of the little little news items: arrests made at Christian-run bookstore after owner refuses to close. Uh, baptism broken up in London. Uh, the British police really don't have a lot to do if this is what they do all day. Uh, in the United States, we have, you know, the governor of Ohio has introduced these regulations that you can have a wedding and you can have music, but you can't dance to the music. And, uh, you, know, you, you can have a band, but only three. No drummer. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> the... Uh, there's a, a, and in Michigan, there the governor is trying to lock down again. The at West Coast, Oregon, Washington, California, the governors have introduced uh, bans on everything. Here in Florida, everything is open, mm -hmm. everything is going on. Um, so we have so essentially, the government's hand is not heavy here, but in other parts of the country and other places in the world, it's very heavy-handed. 
but, but it's interesting. The news of the uh, virus uh, 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 vaccine caused me to lose half my people on Sunday. Sure. I, it was fascinating. The response to people had been, well, we're going to soldier on. We're yeah, dying anyway. There's no else. hope. Let's go to church. But as soon as they announced that the vaccine was on the horizon, huh? half the people stayed home. And I got emails saying, well, we know that this is going to be taken care of shortly, so we just didn't want to chance the last month. So the exact opposite of what I thought was going to happen happened. Oh, my. No. Well, I think 2020 is going to be studied a, a lot just for the statistical anomalies. Ano uh, anomalies. Can't even speak this morning. Even though I've had half a cup of coffee, I feel kind of wired. In fact, today is the first time I went to a Starbucks in a, in many months, and I was tempted, George, because the Starbucks here at the Timeshare community has Krispy Kremes, and I said maybe I'll have a little extra sugar this morning too, and that will help with the show. You, you think it worked? Yeah. yeah, and in fact, where you are in Kissimmee on that main drag there, they've got one of those Krispy Kremes where they make the donuts there. <laughs> you smell it very much. Sign as soon as they're out of the fat fryer and onto the shelf. Uh, Kevin, there's a lot to make you fat in Florida. I there is to. a lot to make you fat, old, and and happy though happy. Um, but but where, where where I'm you know for the sort of religious angle hmm. on this is that. The leadership of the church, once again, is just doing an appalling job. Absolutely appalling. Huh? Uh, we have, instead of bishops, we have nannies. We have Nurse Ratchet in charge of our faith organizations rather than uh, warriors of God. Well, let, let's go back in history and talk about how the church has handled pandemics in the past. The Black Plague, a uh, very famous pandemic killed half of Europe the church was involved it was there it was on call the m many priests died many clerics died uh, many nuns died uh, many monks died uh, the church was as devastated as uh, the people the c civilians the church did not say don't go to church during the pandemic of the black peg George well they put people with the people will say well they were ignorant back then they didn't know how it was spread um, we have uh, news reports uh, out of Greece where a bishop of the Greek Orthodox Church died of COVID and the Greek secular press is saying ha 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 he got up from taking Holy Communion and the, the COVID was passed by the communion cup and the Greek church is responding oh it's impossible no germs can be passed by the communion cup because it's the blood of Christ it's not wine and I don't know if I want to go that far down the road but it you know that uh, this is my second plague um, huh? when I was a young priest I worked in hospice industry and this was the tail end of the a HIV or gay men's at the time it was called gay men's syndrome it was yeah um, we had we didn't know what AIDS was caused by and what we now call AIDS, HIV. And there were talk, did, was it spread by tears? Was it spread in the air? How did this come about? And my job was to minister to those who were dying. In the agency I worked for, half of the clergy declined to see those types of patients. I went ahead and saw them. Now, when I got home, I have wife and children at home at the time, I, but I would get out of the car in the garage I drop my shoes in a little uh, bucket of uh, ammonia I drop my clothing in uh, the laundry machine pour in the ammonia and then I'd take a shower in the outside shower before I went inside um, because it is my duty as a priest to minister to those people in need now the church is relaxed in this case the church has relaxed its obligation to worship on Sunday. But my thinking is, so long as one person wishes to worship and celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ in corporate worship, it is my duty to be there, no matter what my feelings are on the issue. Mm -hmm. And we don't have bishops talking about the duty of the clergy. We don't have bishops talking about... Um, 
the need to uh, meet people where they are and to assure them that they don't need to come, but if they do come, we will be there for them. Instead, we have clergy repeating, uh, we have bishops repeating health warnings of which they have no uh, understanding other than maybe the lawyers tell them, well, that's the prudent way to go so you don't incur liability. It's just, I, I, I can't say this, well, I've been saying it for 30 years, but I'm just so embarrassed by the bishops of the Episcopal Church. They're just not men of Christ and women of Christ. They're not manly men anymore. Not manly men. <laughs> not godly bishops. It, it's, a, it's a strange time, and COVID kind of reveals that weakness in the church. You know. and, and I'm not one of these nut jobs that, you know, are like the Greek Orthodox were saying, well, it's absolutely impossible. No transmission of disease can take place in Holy Communion. No, I, I think that's entirely possible. But we're smart enough to figure out how that doesn't happen. No. So we have a little protocol. I mean, I, when I celebrate, I've got you know some elements in a closed container that were put there beforehand, and I consecrate them with the lid on. The priest's host, I consume. The wine, I consume. Then when it times to distribute the communion, I put on my gloves, I put on my mask, go out into the congregation and drop them into their hands, wearing gloves, and not touching my face or itching myself, and keeping people socially distanced. And, you know, there are ways to respond to modern science and hygiene, but without abandoning your understanding of what's taking place in worship. And, you know, it, this is a case where it's not just Justin Welby being a horse's ass. No. It's the entire leadership <laughs> of the Western Church. The Church has COVID confusion and doesn't understand its responsibility in this, that people are looking for hope, hope in Christ, hope in the Church, a place where they will receive the sacraments in a place where they can receive hope. And the church is like, yeah, we'll be back to you after COVID's over. Thank you very much. And that, and it, you just wait till this is really over and see how empty your churches are. Yeah, this is this is this was a test, and uh, for the most part, I would say many parts of the church, many denominations have failed the test. And th thank God for tests. Now you know. My prejudice, I have no evidence to support this, but I believe that people appreciate the fact that I am there, even if they're not. Sure. That uh, I am doing my duty, standing watch as I should. Um, come rain or come shine. So, I, we talked about, not, over the past we talked about the statistics of COVID. You it's an extremely contagious disease. You are likely to get it if you're exposed to it. You are 20% of you who get it and uh, have certain preconditions will end up in a hospital. Of that, initially back in April and March and May time period, 20% of the people who went into the hospital died. We're now down to 3% of that. Uh, people who are hospitalized die. We, we figured out a way to treat it um, in its viral form and reduce the viral load on the body. We now have a vaccine that should be released uh, by the early part of the next year. That's great. I think the study of the statistics and all this and the fear and the media will be something people will be studying a hundred years from now. What happened in 2020 that shut down the whole world over such a small death rate. Well, it, it is a scary death. It, you, you're not walking down the street and I'm dead. You're, you're hooked up to an intubator in a hospital on your stomach dying. I mean, that's, that's scary. Nobody wants that. So uh, the, the panic-demic has a reason for being a panic-demic. Statistics also apply in this post-election confusion we're in. Uh, we had the presidential election November 3rd, 4th, whenever it was a couple uh, weeks ago. And Trump is certain that he won because he's claiming there's election fraud. 
Biden is certain he won because he says, well, the press says I won. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and so we're in this confusion because, you know, statistically, there's been a violation, certainly of Branford's law and all this, in some of the places that Biden won. You're like, wait a minute. You know, I don't know if that really makes a lot of sense because... Um, and this is the case the Trump people are making. How how did he win there when nobody's won there? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Can we investigate? Oh, pff, no. He won. You don't need to look at... Don't, uh, don't look behind the curtain. And so we're in this confusion point. Because Trump certainly isn't conceding. I don't think he will ever concede. Biden has the support of the popular press and... Many people are just giving up and say, well, all right, fine, we'll have Biden as our president. How bad could he be? Meanwhile, there's this interested people who, well, if Trump really won, we want to know. And we would like him to be our president. If Biden won, we really kind of want to know. And we like him to be our president. But now we're in this confusion time, George. The, the, it's the, the post-election count confusion. Because the press is saying there's no question about it. Biden won and we're telling you so. And Trump is saying, I don't know, guys. If you look at this, there's statistical anomalies. Nobody can deny that. Can we investigate them? And you made the you made the prediction. You said not prediction. You said last week I give uh, Trump a seventy percent chance of winning through the courts in all of this. That was bold. I would never go. I you know I, I would like him to win if he won the election that would be great if Biden won that's fine I, you know, I'll take the loss but you know is it really a, a, an election if it's won by the courts up to you what, what do you say George well I, I uh, first I need to distinguish between what people want to happen mm -hmm. and what people what will happen it's a very foolish thing to listen to the mainstream media, and I would now include the, the Fox News channel on this, in listening to their uh, derision of the Trump arguments. Because the arguments are being driven by more by wishful thinking than by rational analyses of the issues. I, I think I think I know enough to be able to lay out the Trump and the Republican strategy. I do not know enough to whether to say it is entirely convincing because I have not seen the evidence. I've only seen the arguments has been laid out and the, well, first you have to, you have to understand that to prove major fraud takes months, if not years. and there's not that time to do that here to prove beyond a reasonable doubt in a criminal case that somebody committed fraud that takes you know a long time and, and, and our constitution is set up that this happens kind of rapidly there's the election there's the meeting of the electoral college uh, the certification of that vote and then there's a the transition it's the so there's several issues here and I, I think we should we need to hear them out and divide them out so that you really do understand what's going on. Um, now remember the same people that told you that uh, Trump was ahead by 17 points on election day in Wisconsin and was uh, I think ahead 10 points in Florida. Uh, not Trump, Biden. Biden, excuse That's me. That's right. That's right. That Biden was ahead 17 points and that this would be an absolute blowout that the entire world, the Republicans would lose 25 seats so on so forth. Consider the source, the, the people who for four years have been peddling the Russia conspiracy and mm -hmm. the, the, the PP tapes and all this and that. It's all been shown to be untrue, as has been all the uh, polling and prognostications of the experts. So let's just stop and look at a level playing field. The, the Trump plan, as I see it, is not to flip states, but to omit states. What does that mean? Well, let's just take two, for example. We have the state of Pennsylvania, where we have 
a number of lawsuits that have been filed and some have been thrown out. Does that mean anything? No, it doesn't. You throw, in these things, you throw as much mud against the wall as you can to see what sticks while you make your major case. And the major case being put forward by the team led by Rudy Giuliani. Now, for those of you without memories or from our foreign viewers, Rudy Giuliani, Giuliani is the president's attorney. Before that, he was probably the most successful mayor of New York City as a Republican since Fiorello LaGuardia. Sure. And before that, he was the U.S. attorney for New York, and he was the one, he was the major, he broke the mafia. He broke the Michael Milken and the Ivan Boskis and the Wall Street frauds of the 80s. If there's any, he is, has one of the best noses for corruption, and he's incorruptible. Uh, it's been tried, uh, and, he, and he doesn't do it. Now, he's flamboyant, and he has many personal failings. Uh, he's got failings. He's no saint. <laughs> he's no saint, but Rudy Giuliani is probably the best at what he does, and he has a track record. Now, Rudy Giuliani is staking his life's reputation as being the most one of the most powerful, successful anti-corruption prosecutors in the nation's history on these issues. In Pennsylvania, you had... Uh, you have an equal protection issue argument uh, that go, will go before the federal courts. In some, in Republican counties, if you were sent in a ballot and if your signature was omitted or if the, if the marks weren't properly filled out or anything like that, your ballot was rejected. That's how they do it. In Democratic-controlled counties, that ballot was put aside and members of the Democratic Party in that town or city, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, would call you and say, you can come in and fix your ballot. And you could come in and redo your ballot to make sure it was properly recorded. That is an equal protection violation. Then we it, have it, it's, not, it's not cheating. They didn't go mark the ballots and correct them for them. They just contacted the people they wanted to come in and have their ballots corrected, omitting the Republicans. Under, uh, yes, and in those, and if you were a Republican in Philadelphia and you messed up your ballot, you didn't get a call to come fix it. This is being attested to by sworn affidavits. Uh, I have no first-hand knowledge. I can only report the evidence as presented in these initial lawsuits. Mm -hmm. Then we have the state issue of ballots must be counted before a Republican and a Democratic observer and in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh, the Republicans were prohibited from watching the vote counting, which should, uh, which under clear black letter Pennsylvania law says those votes cannot be counted because they're invalid. So under the state law and under the federal law, we've got these various claims. Then we have the issue being put forward by a, an attorney named Sidney Powell who's famous for being the attorney for uh, General uh, Flynn, who has been able to basically beat the FBI and the Justice Department and have them concede that they acted illegally. In framed Moscow. him. They framed, framed him, yes. She has presented evidence that the software used by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, it's the software that, uh, that runs the machines. The software uh, is crooked and she has said I don't know if this is to be true she has said that this software allowed people if it was connected to the internet those who had the back door could go in and change votes erase votes add votes the statistical analyses that you've been reading about um, where MIT mathematicians are saying, well, this is impossible for it's this what it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> For example, the, but they have discovered what the, the algorithm, and an algorithm is a, is a mathematical formula that kicks in and determines behavior. Uh, algorithms are used by Facebook and to see what ads you get and all this and that, but the algorithms that have been shown uh, to be uh, in working 
were that if you didn't have, if, if your candidate was losing at a certain point, then spurious votes would be introduced to give your candidate more votes. And the ratio was two thirds, one third. So that's why the, argu the mathematical argument is if Trump was winning until midnight, then they shut all the machines down for several hours, then they started again, then all of a sudden, the votes counted went two thirds, one thirds to Biden. That is an impossibility. Then the other uh, political argument is that Hillary Clinton uh, did had 400,000 more votes in New York City than Joe Biden did in this last election. Yet Joe Biden and Joe Biden, uh, Hillary Clinton ran ahead of Joe Biden in all the major cities in the United States except for Philadelphia, Atlanta, Milwaukee, Las Vegas, and Pittsburgh. And in those cities, Joe Biden did better than Barack Obama did when Barack Obama ran the first time. How is it that in Milwaukee, you've got a 90% turnout and in Cleveland, you have a 50% turnout. And in Milwaukee, you have all these extra hundreds of thousands of votes for Joe Biden, and you don't have them in Cleveland or Chicago or Los Angeles or, or I'm sorry, Detroit was also one of the Detroit, other yeah, Detroit, yeah, yeah. So the ex external evidence of fraud and manipulation is all being presented. Now, the Republicans' job and in Georgia, you have now this case where the governor and the secretary of state are being credible, credible accusations of criminal fraud, where they were paid bribes to purchase this voting system. So the governor, who's a Republican, and the secretary of the state, a Republican, um, were there. You know, the secretary of state is accused of his wife receiving very large sums of money from the vendor of the software to purchase it and now it's all blown up and the governor and, and of Georgia who's a Republican mind you can't be found because he's basically facing jail time for corruption no. the accusation so put all this together what does it mean will it change the vote tallies may may not uh, will it flip some states uh, one way or the other? They may not, but that's not the Republicans' goal, I believe. The Republicans' goal is to show to the state legislatures in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Nevada, and uh, Wisconsin. I may have left out one. Oh, that, uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina. Georgia. Uh, Nevada. North Carolina has been de decided for Trump. Yeah. That's that's out of okay but it's certainly not Nevada uh, Nevada exactly. doesn't have Dominion um, uh, well the four many, many states, states yeah the four or five states <laughs> yeah uh, the legislatures can be shown not by beyond a reasonable doubt but by a preponderance of evidence that the elections were crooked the remedy is a new election for all ballots below the presidency. So you have new senatorial elections, new congressional elections, new mayor and city and dog catcher elections. And you go back to the old fashioned paper ballots and have them counted with a Republican on one side and a Democrat on the other, making sure that the vote counter doesn't screw up. That was the old system. That's one remedy. What and the other the other is so. But what happens to the presidency? Because you have to have certain guide deadlines met. I met, met twelve. <laughs> so the, the the state legislatures. Yeah. And four of those five are controlled by Republican majorities. Mm -hmm. The state legislatures can either say, "Well, we don't trust this vote outcome, but we're going to roll over and just certify Joe Biden as the winner." We don't trust this outcome, and we think. We know in our hearts that Donald Trump won. It's going to be months before we can prove it, but we still think he won. Or we don't know who won. This is so messed up. We're going to have to do it all over again. We cannot give you 
a result from Georgia or Pennsylvania. If that happens, neither Trump nor Biden get over 270 electoral votes in the Electoral College, and it goes to the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives votes by state delegation. There are 26 Republican and 23 Democratic majority and one split delegation. Split, yeah, no. So at the, the House of Representatives would elect the president based on that and the Senate would elect the vice president. The Senate is controlled by the Republicans at this stage. So I believe the strategy, most effective strategy, is not, in other words, here, here's the thing. The Republicans don't need to get convince CNN or Fox or anybody else. They need to convince the, the Republican state legislatures, legislators, to stand, you know, on their side. And they'll use, Trump is going to have massive rallies in Georgia, and he's going to invite all these legislators to come and uh, stand to be counted. So the pressure's on individuals. So I believe, given all this, there's a, probably a 70% chance, I give the odds of 70% that Trump will be inaugurated the next president. And I also think we're going to see some major criminal indictments over the coming year. Um, who knows? Yeah, well, it, and there, there is that. My, my point has always been the press will never let it get that far. Uh, I don't think the press, you could hand the press, you know, the deep throat of Dominion who wrote the software and they would not put them up. Yeah, because they hid Hunter Biden's laptop. They hid all this evidence against Biden. They hid his cancer society that raised all the money uh, and just paid off employees. They, you know, there's a protection gamut, a circle of the wagons gamut that the press will do. Even the conservative press falls in line. Well, of course he was, nothing happened here, you know. And I think that if something is overturned, the the world will be so surprised because we'll wait. We didn't have any foreknowledge. Well, the the foreknowledge was contained in the press. The press didn't tell you a thing. Now, I don't, I don't, I personally don't give Biden seventy percent chance of, of winning. That that's George. I really don't know who is going to win. However, this is twenty twenty. Biden would be the cherry on top of twenty twenty. Okay, but. Well, than so with Trump. I mean, it's just like... <laughs> but the... Uh, you, you make a powerful argument, mm -hmm. and I would say that you're right were this to go back to another popular referendum, mm -hmm. because the media, that's where they have the power. But we're now not talking about voters. We're talking about local politicians in Harrisburg and Atlanta and in Reno and, and uh, Lansing. Um, well, who, I, do you, if you're a Pennsylvania politician and a Republican, mm -hmm. and you want to hit, and if you want a future in politics, will you break the party line on this, the most important issue of your entire voting life? Sure. I think the Republicans will be able to put the squeeze on their members in the legislatures to, and it may not be, you know, it may be a step too far to certify Trump as the winner but to say that we can't certify anybody. That's an easier way forward, but it still provides the same end. Yeah, I, I do think, you know, this ends up somewhere in the Supreme Court after legislatures, you know, don't invalidate, but don't trust their vote um, and ask the Supreme Court to weigh in. Well, certainly, so, the, yeah. the, the, whoever, it will go because whoever wins will dispute the, the right. one. Yeah. And yeah. so, no matter what, um, we're going to find Biden or Trump calling this a stolen election. If uh, Trump is inaugurated, Biden and every Democrat is, you, you see little people just exploding. What was that? Uh, just he, he exploded over there, you know, uh, in frustration and anger and uh, just that, that uh, I hate the world. And if Trump loses, you're going to see a little bit of that in... Uh, some places as well because 
uh, a lot of people incorrectly idolize Trump uh, uh, in an incorrect way. And well, yeah, if you look at the polls and how we can trust them anymore, it's yeah, it, you, you can't. If you can look at the polls, you can't look at the polls, George. <laughs> Well, from, but it may give us some little steam. Seventy percent of Republicans believe the election was crooked. Sure. Fifty-six percent of the population think Joe Biden was elected president. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Forty-four percent think it's not true. It's a falsehood. So if Joe Biden is elected president, what happens? He goes in... Uh, and we're still counting the House of Representatives, and it'll look like there'll only be four or five seats separating the Democrats and the Republicans. The Senate will stay Republican. Mm -hmm. The judiciary at the Supreme Court is Republican. Joe Biden will come into office in the worst position of any president in modern history, because the Democratic Party is immediately going to implode between the uh, Socialist. progressive wing yeah. and the uh, uh, moderates. Who have, who have seen many of their members get knocked out because of the defund the police and Green New Deal craziness. So the Republicans, and last time around, uh, Pelosi uh, to become uh, Speaker of the House, 15 members of the Democratic Party voted against her. 10 of those Democratic congressmen and women have come back into office. So it's not certain that she's going to be elected um, the next Speaker of the House, but even if she is, the only power that uh, he will have is by executive authority, and as we saw with uh, uh, with the Democrats and uh, Donald Trump, any time you the president changes uh, a policy such as an immigration, people go judge shopping. Last time around, they looked for a Democratic-friendly judge to put in a nationwide injunction. This time they'll go find a Republican judge to put in a nationwide injunction. Uh, if we have a Biden win, we basically have chaos for two years. And the chaos, I think, will allow, uh, and Trump is not going to go away. In fact, the talk is he's going to start his own news, news network. service. Well, I've spoken for eight years on Anklan Scripted about what I call the pendulum of politics. It goes left, it goes right. You know, we went from Ronald Reagan, Bush to Bill Clinton, uh, Gore to Bush, just back and forth to, you know, to Obama. And we've always done this little pendulum. Here, the pendulum was swinging left and stopped. It, 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 it it dead centered down because it elected a Republican Senate, a Repu uh, and mostly Republican Congress. The judiciary, the whole country is Republican except for one man and Camilla uh, Deville. Th the pendulum was right, right here now in the middle. Now is it going to start swinging right again, or is it just hiccuping before it goes left again? And you know, I I see the the. The public either went in and deliberately did not vote for Trump, or there was um, collusion, or corruption, or fraud, or software, or algorithms. And we are in this election counting chaos, confusion. And it's going to last a long time. How long did uh, Gore Trump take? 37 days? Mm -hmm. We're 10 days out. So you guys are going to have to go through the anxiety. I'm going to go through the anxiety. George is going to go through the anxiety of just watching this play out. But you know who wins in the end? We read the book, so we know. Um, th this is why Scripture says be anxious in nothing. This isn't worth your anxiety. It's worth your interest. This is not worth fretting over. You, you fret over the poor, you fret over the unsaved, you fret over the widows, you, you don't fret over politics. Of course, yeah. it's Jesus who's in charge. Mm -hmm. And it's not his church, it's not men, it's not institutions, it's mm -hmm. God above. Yeah. I will be a little anxious. Just because, you know, I, 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 this is the way I am. God made me a little anxious. <laughs> All right, now, so 
please also hear me to say I am not uh, saying this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this is the this is, I'm reporting. Well, uh, this is your opinion that you give him a seventy percent chance based on these things you see. Actually, no, it's not my opinion. Okay. Uh, I'm reporting what the Republicans are saying and okay. doing, and my opinion is that there's a seventy percent likely chance that it'll succeed. So I'm only saying I'm only offering the end result if all they say is true. Sure. I have no knowledge that it's true, and I have no opinion on whether they yeah. are correct or incorrect. But if, but if I compare the two arguments, uh, the D Democrats' argument is uh, delay and obfuscation. The Republicans are the ones on the on the uh, offensive, and I always back the guy on the offense. Yeah. Well, and you'll see in the news, you know, everything bad is going to be very trumpeted in the Trump era. So if Trump loses a single action in a Pennsylvania court, ah, it's all over. He had nothing going there for sure. Even though there's another sixty things you know they're trying to do. Uh, you so, only have to win once, Kevin. Yes. Uh, you can look at the how many how many lawsuits were there filed against the tobacco companies until the one person won a billion dollar lawsuit. Yeah. Uh, so well, we we shall see. Um, obviously. This is a time that we get the church back involved in society uh, in this COVID time. Pray for the vaccine to be distributed and don't fret about the politics. This has been a great episode where we got to talk raw uh, about things we know about, but we're probably not experts on. But, you know, that's that's the nature of Unscripted, isn't it? I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. You've been watching episode 632 of Anglican Unscripted.